Welcome, everybody, to the Breakwater Mega Embassy Church. Today is April 26th, 2022. And we just came through the Easter season, which we we're really excited about. And last week, we looked at the multiple mountains of sources that Luke had for his gospel. He's got not only himself and actually apostles is pretty much his responsibility, but in his gospel, he's got eyewitnesses and he's got endless uh, written sources. He spent two years in uh, Caesarea and Jerusalem, that whole area, and then another two years with Paul up in in uh, Rome during Paul's imprisonment. So it seems amazing to me that the concept that there's only four sources that the gospel writers use. Of course, Mark only has one source. He's got Peter as his source, right? It seems amazing that anybody would hold that view in this day and age, knowing what we know about things. So even here uh, at the end of John's gospel, you can see that John says, she just did many miraculous signs, which are not recorded, right? But the purpose of what has been written is that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you can have life in his name. That's the ultimate purpose of the Gospels are to bring people into relationship with Jesus Christ. But there's so many things that could be done. He has so many sources. And Jesus did so many things, he tells us, that if they were written down, the world could not contain the books. All right? Mm -hmm. Which is to say, when we come to the Gospels, we have bullet point or cliff notes. All right? Anybody ever read cliff notes? Yeah. That's how I got through high school. Mm -hmm. So it's just summaries. Now, if you think about the fact they called Jesus the teacher and he taught every day for three years, it would fill hundreds of books. Even in the Acts of Apostles, which we're going to look at a little bit today, Acts of Apostles covers a time period of 30 years. So you don't have 30 years of reports in Acts of the Apostles. you got a very succinct travel journal that begins in uh, Jerusalem and ends up in Rome. So we're very grateful for the Acts of the Apostles because without it, we wouldn't know where Paul comes into the picture. We wouldn't know about the early beginnings of the church. We also wouldn't know about the post-resurrection 40-day seminar that Jesus remained on earth. Do we find that in any other gospel? Mm -hmm. We would miss that completely. So we're very, very fortunate for Luke's very diligent research into filling in some of the blanks that are missing in the gospels. So what we wanna look at today is how Jesus wrote Matthew's gospel. Normally we say Mark, Mark's gospel is Peter's preaching. So it really should be Peter's gospel, right? Mm -hmm. So where do the apostles get all this information? Where does Matthew get all this information that becomes the fountainhead of the other gospels? Where does that come from? And so this is really maybe a two or three part effort and I'm piecing it together from a couple different places so bear with me but as we go to Acts chapter 1 Jesus showed himself to them giving many proofs after his death so after his death and resurrection he showed that he was alive okay a period of 40 days they saw him he spoke with them about the kingdom of God. Why was that necessary? Okay, it's important that we realize the significance of this 40-day seminar, that he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. If you remember many of his parables about the kingdom of God, Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God is within you. So how much kingdom of God teaching is there in the, in the gospel of Matthew? A ton of it. So... In this 40-day period, he spoke to them while he was with them about the Father's promise. Now, this Father's promise is the coming of the Holy Spirit is embedded in the prophecies of the Old Testament. They're going to have to know all about that. We're going to see that reflected 
in the preaching of the early church, but also we're going to see many, many scriptures that are present in Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel is going to be full of scripture for some reason. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist. Now, if you look at just these two verses, it takes 10 seconds to read them, okay? So in this 40-day period, we can imagine that Jesus took more than 10 seconds to teach them. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. What do you say? Mm -hmm. So what this is, is the catalog li listing of the bulk of information that he is going to convey to them during this 40 day period. It's one of the chief subjects in the 40 day period. And Jesus is going to present metac meticulous teaching about the kingdom of God. They got they have to get this straight before they go out into the world and preach the gospel. OK, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the day of Pentecost is extremely important. It launches the church as the birthday. Speaking of birthdays, uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit and Pentecost is the birthday of the church. OK, everything has to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All of those things he is going to instruct them. Check it out. So one of the times when they came together, it says, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They still want to know about their current messianic expectation. What, according to their worldview, what the Messiah was supposed to do when he comes and restore Israel. And he's going, no, that's not what this is all about. You're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit. You're going to be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost ends of the earth. Okay? So even at this time, they need this re-education program that they're gonna go through with Jesus. So if you, it took 18 seconds to read Acts 1.8. But this is only 30 seconds worth of teaching content, right? So in the next verse or so, Jesus ascends into heaven. So it's reasonable to imagine that Jesus taught them for more than 30 seconds over his last 40 days. Mm -hmm. knowing that Jesus is the preeminent teacher and Jesus could sit there forever all day long and teach some stuff. Mm -hmm. So immediately after Acts 1, 8, Jesus is taken up to heaven and washed him out of sight, uh, going up, the ascension, as we call it. So we are told by Luke, thank God, that he informed us of this, that Jesus taught them for 40 days about the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit. And all we get are two teachings amounting to 28 seconds, which is to say they're just highlights. All on board with that? Mm -hmm. They're just telling you what the, yeah. the coursework is for this crash course. Mm -hmm. So there's other records of what is taught during this course, but it's my particular opinion that the that the synthesis of this is found in Matthew's gospel, and that becomes the exemplar for obviously Mark, who very closely follows Matthew. And then Luke has his own sources, of course, as we looked at that, and plenty of eyewitness sources. But there's no reason to imagine that uh, Matthew's gospel hadn't already penetrated after 30 years in existence. Okay, so what we want to understand here is that the apostles absolutely needed a crash course in Christology. Christology means the study of Christ and the kingdom of God and those sorts of things. So one of the major things that Jews did not expect from the Messiah was for him to suffer crucifixion and be raised from the dead. And for the Messiah to not only be Christ, because that's what Messiah and Christ are synonymous terms, it means the anointed one, which would be the son of David, but also the son of God, the Lord come in an in incarnation. So that all needs to be worked out during this 40 day period. There's a sermon that Paul makes on his first missionary journey, and he goes through some of the history of Israel because he's speaking to a synagogue and how God brought Israel, the Savior Jesus, as he promised. John the Baptist, 
and he's got scripture whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He's talking to the children of Abraham and God fearing Gentiles. So it's a mixed crowd in this congregation. So it's to us, including the Gentiles, that this message comes. And he tells that the people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus. They did not recognize him as son of God. They did not recognize him as Messiah. Yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. They carried out what was written about him. God raised him from the dead. And after that, for many days, he was seen by those who traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. Okay, so we learn here even from Paul on his missionary journey that he understands completely well of the importance of this 40-day period. All right? So we know that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central core of all things Christian. Without it, you don't have Christianity. So even though the resurrection is clearly embedded in the teaching of Jesus Christ in all four Gospels, and even though that there's a firm root for the resurrection in the Old Testament, there's no one at the time of Christ that expected Jesus the Messiah to suffer and die as a ransom for sin, let alone be resurrected, okay? So there are at least six passion teachings. This means where Jesus explains that he needs to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die and be raised from the dead, at least, at least six, which means there's more. Because again, the gospels don't give you every teaching that Jesus ever made about everything. So the fact that it's in there so many times in, in the four gospels shows you that he did teach this on numerous occasions. But in all of these passion predictions, the disciples failed to understand what he was teaching, okay? And normally we like to use Thomas as the whipping boy of doubt, right? The doubting Thomas. But no one anticipated, no one expected the Messiah would suffer, die, or be crucified, be raised from the dead. No one, not even the teachers and the elders of Israel, not even the devil. So let's look at a couple of these, okay? Even the chief priests, after the death of Christ, they said, we remember that he said, after three days, I'll rise again from the dead. So to prevent the body from being stolen, they went and made the, the tomb secure, all right? So it's natural to doubt the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead because it's, it's scientifically impossible. What would you say? It would be a miracle. So even in ancient times, without any modern technology or deification of naturalism, the apostles, who were the closest followers, all doubted the reality of the resurrection. Okay? Everybody did. They were all doubting Thomases. Not one apostle believed that the resurrection of Messiah was necessary or possible. What would it take? It would take the resurrection to change all that. Okay? There were many post-resurrection appearances. Jesus was seen at least on 10 occasions within weeks after his death. Paul says that Jesus was seen by 500 people. Uh, one of my favorites is his discussion of the two guys on the road to Emmaus. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So he walked along with those guys on the road to Emmaus on the day of the resurrection, and which is about seven miles. So seven miles, it's at least a two-hour hike. And they were discussing everything that happened, and Jesus shows up and joins them in this walk. And he says, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets exposed. So he, first of all, he, he approaches him. We don't have it here, but he says, hey, what's going on, guys? He goes, what? You're the only person in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on here? <laughs> and so then he took this time to explain to them through the law, the law of Moses, all the prophets, 
and said everything in scripture concerning himself. So you can see what the remedial work that needs to be done to explain thoroughly, to make clear, to translate, interpret the law, the Psalms and the prophets concerning himself. So he asked them a question, didn't the Christ have to suffer these things and enter into his glory, right? What's their answer? No, <laughs> we don't know anything about that, right? You notice they didn't even answer him a word because they couldn't think of one scripture that they were taught about the many things that the Messiah would suffer. You know, Isaiah 53 didn't come into their their picture. It wasn't the first scripture they thought of. You know, Zechariah and Psalm 22, they didn't just start going through Messianic scriptures about the suffering of Messiah, the need for his atoning sacrifice and his resurrection. They didn't know because it didn't. Ex they didn't expect that. They believed some of what the uh, prophets taught about the Messiah, but not all that the prophets spoke, okay? About his atoning death, his resurrection, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> they didn't have you know, a little pocket Bible that they could turn to with all the prophecies dealing with Messianic sufferings, okay? <clears throat> so it's only after this resurrection that they began to learn so much about Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures. So these guys, the Amen guys, go to Jerusalem and they say, it's true, the Lord is risen. All right? And then Jesus appears to them. They think it's a ghost, right? Why are you troubled? Why do you have doubts? Look at me, touch me. A, goat, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see. So they're terrified by this appearance of Jesus after his resurrection because as far as they're concerned, they had no scriptural starting point to understand the bodily resurrection. They're scared to death. All they can think of, this is a ghost. <laughs> Maybe we're having a hallucination or something like that. They couldn't believe in the resurrection, even with the physical evidence standing in front of them. And so Thomas wasn't the only one who was invited to touch Jesus. They all needed this touch from Jesus, right? So when he said he, he showed them his hands and feet, and what do we learn here? They still didn't believe it, okay? They were so amazed. So he goes, hey, you got some some eating longer. It's been like three days, you know? <laughs> So they gave him a piece of boiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. So is it a physical resurrection? Absolutely. Okay. But even with Jesus standing in front of them, they couldn't believe it. So we want to hitchhike on that a little bit. And he says, and this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled, written about me. Law of Moses, the Psalms, and prophets, and he opened their minds so they could understand Scripture. So now we can see the kinds of, of lesson plan that Jesus has during this 40-day period following his resurrection to bring them up to speed about everything they're going to need from their Scriptures before they go out into the world and launch the Christian movement. All right? This is a big chore that Jesus has in front of him. Okay, Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Of course, it's going to begin in Jerusalem. It doesn't begin in Rome. And he says, you are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, which my father promised. And he's going to give you power from on high. Dunamis power, miraculous power, strength from heaven, strength from God, all right? So Jesus promised them this dynamic power that was gonna explode their doubts, empower them to be a witness in the world, which we know they did. So there's actually 40 days between verse 49 and 50, okay? It tells us there in Acts. Between 49 and 50, when he uh, leads them out, he blesses them, taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him. They went to Jerusalem. They're all happy. Okay. Between here, you're witnesses of these things. And I'm going to send you what my father promised. 
all right? So there's a big 40-day gap there between the fruition of that. Jesus describes his, his ascension while well, he's blessing them, taken up into heaven, they worshiped him, and they're continually in the temple praising God. Okay, so what happened over that 40-day period? So Luke tells us the core curriculum, the law, the prophets, open their minds. He opened their minds so they can understand the importance of his deity, his sufferings, his atoning death, the resurrection, repentance, and the fact that preaching is the mechanism for salvation. All right, preaching the gospel. And it's gonna to go to all nations, which is the Gentile mission. So Jesus also had to instruct them about the Gentile mission. There would come a time and a place in the life of the early church when Christianity would leave the confines of Judaism and embrace the, the Gentile mission to go into all the nations, because that's what the word nations means. And his ascension into heaven promised to send the Holy Spirit to initiate the new covenant. All of that needs to be instructed. They need to understand all of that. They're still living in the old covenant. They're still thinking that Messiah is going to come and fulfill the old covenant. No, there's a whole brand new thing that's going on here. Okay. So he spent 40 days <clears throat> for global evangelism, all those sorts of things we talked about. And as I say, we wouldn't know about this if it wasn't for Luke. So we got to be pretty happy about that. Wouldn't you like to know where all these prophecies are written? Okay. We find them in Matthew's gospel and then subsequently in Mark, Luke, and John. So again, he showed himself alive, convincing proofs. It's a defining a fact. It's certain. It's infallible proof, he says. Infallible proof. He appeared to them, which means that they were able to see him, visit with him. When they met together, you're going to receive power, you're going to be witnesses, you're going to the end of the earth, and he's taken up to them. So this power is what exploded Christianity in the world. It's not because you had some milk toast Johnny Appleseed that they created into this super messianic being. It took them 30 years to do that. The church exploded immediately on the scene, started immediately in Jerusalem, immediately drew thousands and thousands and thousands of Mexican Jews. The persecution Early persecution of Christians spread it throughout the world, and they began to take this message everywhere. So it was really important that the apostles had their doctrine down solid and straight and get it out in the world, and there'd be no reason in the world why these guys would not write a small manual, teaching manual, to be taken into, into the world. Yeah, there's just, there's just no reason for that not to happen. All right? So it is my opinion that during this 40-day period, colloquium, this conference, this meeting, this symposium, this workshop, that Jesus himself helped them draft and create Matthew's gospel. Okay? Why not? Do you think you're going to sit down with Jesus 40 days after you just touched his wounded side and not write anything down? We looked at this huge uh, commentary of Matthew that Jerome wrote in two weeks. Entire commentary, two weeks. Jerome could do that. The, the apostles and 5,000 Jews couldn't do that. I mean, it's, re it's ridiculous what the anarchy that's just raging right now in New Testament theology. It's just incredible. So... Jesus speaking is Jesus dictating. What do you say? Yes. If Jesus is teaching, he is dictating. And if his words are taken down, it forms the foundation of the first gospel. Thank you, Luke, for informing us of this important session. So taking dictation, we've seen in this course of these sessions that we've had was normal. That's what scribes did. That's what they do. All right. Okay. Look at what John says. Okay. Matthew says, 
And all this was done to fulfill it was spoken of uh, spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Okay, look at look at John after he's raised. What miraculous sign will you give them? And he says, well, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. So Jesus said, uh, it's taken 46 years to build it. John says, after he was raised from the dead, they recalled what he said, and they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus spoken. So this cryptic message, which I'm sure is longer than that, about the resurrection went uninterpreted until he was raised from the dead. So in, in this period after the resurrection, there was so many things that they came to understand uh, in this 40 day period. And usually we don't have any idea of what took place in these, in this 40 days, right? But we have transcription of it. We have recorded meetings as far as we're concerned in the gospels. This was a huge re-education program. Okay. Now the eyewitnesses included not only the, the more than 500 and, and whatnot, but uh, the, the, the women, the apostles, the so many people, what, what did he teach? Okay, what did he teach? Okay. Now, we want to see how hard it was for, for them to get a picture of this and why it was necessary for this 40-day period, okay? And how this found its way into a Matthew's Gospel. So, let me go to here. So, the earliest... Disciples doubted the resurrection. No apostle, no Jew, no one believed that it was necessary. Okay? So there'd be no need to create such an idea because no one expected that. No one believed it was going to happen. So you wouldn't manipulate the text yeah. to create a resurrection when you didn't need it to happen. And we look at how difficult it was for them to even accept this after he rose again from the dead and stood in front of them. So Jesus told them so many times over and over again. Uh, one of my favorite ones is when he's in Caesarea Philippi and he began to explain to them that he got to be put to death and Peter rebukes him. We've been over that a couple of times since it's Easter, but it's one of my favorite ones. And Peter rebukes him and says, no, this will never happen to you. And that's just good messianic expectation. He's just repeating what he's taught by everybody. He's a good Jew. He's gone to Sabbath school. That doesn't happen to Messiah. Okay, <laughs> that will never happen. Can you imagine telling Jesus, no, no, not to you. Jesus is trying to teach you something, right? Yeah. And another occasion, there's many of these, but I'm just going to show you a couple. They're going through Galilee, and Jesus is teaching them, his disciples again. The Son of Man will be handed over to a man who will kill him. Three days later, he'll be raised to life, Mark 9.30. Uh, 32, but they didn't understand what the teaching meant, and they're afraid to ask him. He'd done it so many times, they just got. Yeah. I go, no, I'm not gonna ask him. <laughs> We're not gonna ask him. So he got chewed out last time, so forget it. So it's only after the resurrection of Christ from the dead that they began to understand the need and purpose of this crucifixion and resurrection. Okay. So what would be their motivation to create such an impossible lie as a resurrection? Right? What would be it? It's that story that got them tortured and killed. So this is a week prior to his death and resurrection. He's on his way to Jerusalem, okay? And he's going to explain to them exactly what's going to happen in Jerusalem on their way in. He told them what was going to happen. The Son of Man, his personal designation, will be betrayed, condemned, handed over, flogged, killed. Three days later, he will rise. So he took them aside for a private tete-a-tete, -tete, a tutorial. Hey guys, this is what's gonna happen. I'm going into town. Uh, perhaps now you can get the resurrection party planned. Right? Going into town, they're going to arrest me, they're going to kill me. 
I'm going to rise again on three days. You know that. Be ready for that. It's going to be great, right? And then what do they do? The first thing they ask is not one single question about the death and resurrection. They say, can we sit on your right and your left and come to your glory? So where did, where did that teaching go? Right, right over somewhere. <laughs> it just, they, they missed it completely. They have no idea what he talked about. We're going to sit on your right and your left when you come in your glory, which means your messianic glory. When you take over the king, you become king of Israel. When you vanquish the Romans, we want, it's going to happen next week. We're coming to town. It's going to be awesome. We're going to sit on your right and left. Okay? They're not talking about 2,000 years from now. They're not talking about eschatology, end times, or them sitting on thrones in heaven. They, have, they could not even think that far ahead. Okay? It's impossible for them. They can't even ask a question like that. What do you say? Yeah, they're not going to go, well, could you talk to us about, you know, the end times of the world and how we're going to be able to rule with you in heaven and all that? Come on. All they can see is starry eyes when they get into Jerusalem. They're going to sit with him. And this is every preacher's nightmare, right? Preach as hard as you can and clear as you can. People don't hear one word. They just, they're off somewhere. They, they don't even know where they go. So we also know a significant breakthrough in the history of the world is the fact that Jesus included female disciples in his followers, okay? Never heard of, never happened, scandalous. It's because Jesus was radical in his inclusion of women. So one of the questions we might ask the church today, are, is the Christian church radical in its inclusion of women? And if you can say yes to that, then you're following Jesus Christ. If you say no to that, we don't know what you're following, all right? Women are 50, at least 50% of the church. They should be discipled. They should be empowered. They should be taught. They should be discipled. They should be released on the world. <laughs> All right. Okay. So check it out. After his resurrection, the women were the first granted his post-resurrection appearance. We all know that, right? First ones to see the resurrected uh, Christ were women. Now, that didn't happen by accident. For all those who believe in the sovereignty of God, you have to say that it was God's sovereign will to appeal to women first and to give them the privilege and the honor of being the first to witness and give testimony of this core element of Christianity. Come on, give it up. Yeah. So what does Jesus do? He raises women from this tedious, subservient position, which she held both in Judaism and in every culture polytheistic culture in the world. Women were treated the same. But Jesus makes women a co-heir of the same salvation with men. Come on. So the women are going down there in the tomb first early in the morning, and the stone was rolled away. They didn't, they did not find the body of Jesus. They, why were they going to look for the body when they also had been told that he's going to be raised from the dead in three days? Yeah. Right? Well, wait, what? Mm -hmm. Maybe they should have taken them some food and had a little party, picnic down there. But the tomb was not completely empty. <clears throat> there are angels there, two bright angels. All right, cheery, happy. Angelic visitations are very rare in Scripture, okay? And whenever you see an angel, it's a very important declaration. Angels appear to very important people for very important reasons, all right? So this, this is an amazing thing that the angels appeared to women. All right. Two men gleamed like lightning, stood beside them. They were frightened. Of course they would be. Why not? And they said, why do you look for the living among the dead? And they're, they're probably going, I don't know. <laughs> we thought he was dead. How do we know he's living? And then I love this part. And he said, don't you remember how he told you? Right? Well, he's still with you. In Galilee. That he's got to be delivered in the hands of sinful men, be crucified and three day raised again. Don't you remember what they say? Mm, no. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> you mean all those multiple times they told us that? Oh, and then they remembered his words, okay? So then they remembered Mary, Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, other and other women, right? <clears throat> Who told these things to the apostles, all right? So we get women uh, noted in scripture by name. They went early to the tomb. We got them all listed there. 
Uh, normally, women are never mentioned in history for any purpose, and now we have a long list of them honored in God's very word, okay? They were uh, members of his traveling group. They were present at his Galilean ministry. Uh, they were also taught about his brutal death, just like everybody else, just like the men were. Now, I love this part, okay? They go back. They're excited, wouldn't you be? Jesus said, go back and tell the guys. So they, they told all these things to the 11. How come there's only 11? Judas. Judas, gone. And all the others. There's a bunch of people there, okay? Not just 11. Mary, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Mary, the mother of James, others. And others. How many more? Luke is always good to make sure that we understand that there's more than just these few women. There's, there's a lot of women who are part of this discipleship core. So what do they tell? What do they tell the guys? Uh, the missing body of Jesus, the visitation of the angels. They restated the very words of Jesus Christ concerning his teachings about his brutal, brutal death and resurrection. They're going to tell him everything, right? What do you mean? What are women going to hold back? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> they're going to go on and on. No, they're going to tell everything. <laughs> and they're excited. They're they're just they're blown away that they have this privilege of being able to pray to present to the male leadership the core teaching of the resurrection, personally from Jesus himself. Those words are in scripture. Are these ladies eyewitnesses? Of course they are. So when the women come and explain this to the apostles, what would you expect them to do? Believe them. Have a party. Get ready. Jesus is raised from the dead. Oh, they, they should say, oh, yeah, I remember that. Jesus did tell us so many times about suffering and resurrection the third day. Let's rejoice. Let's spread some, some cheese and crackers out and we'll have some finger food. But check it out. What did they do? They did not believe the women. Their words seemed like nonsense. All right? Which is them Telling them what Jesus told them, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the problem here? This, this needs some severe re-education, right? This needs some remedial training for this whole group before they can even begin to understand and to preach the gospel that included the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So I love this. Peter gets up, runs to the tomb, the Shroud of Turin is there, which is not Shroud of Turin, but it's the burial cloth of Jesus Christ lying by itself. He went away wondering what happened. What happened? You know, he didn't go, wow, I'm rejoicing in the resurrection. He didn't recall all the times that Jesus taught them about his passion. None of that. No light came on, right? And another interesting thing is Jesus met the women, but he didn't meet Peter. When the women went to the tomb, they, Jesus met them, but he didn't meet Peter, okay? But the resurrection was just nonsense, nonsense, right? It was nonsense. Let me highlight that. So then we find out that not only did Peter run to the tomb, but John went with him. Behind him came Simon Peter. So John gets added information. They both go to the tomb. And Peter went straight into the tomb because that's the way he is. You know, he's the kind of guy that will jump out of a boat and walk on water. And there was the linen cloth, which we know as the Shroud of Turin. And uh, the other disciple reached there. He also went. They, they saw and believed. What did they believe? That the women told them the truth, that the body was gone. They didn't believe them about the resurrection. Check it out. They still did not understand the scripture, which said that he must rise from the dead. Okay? So they go to the tomb. They stand there. They look at, look at the shroud, the burial shroud. And nothing but linen. Okay? So they don't, they don't know what's going on here. They're going to need an in-depth study of scripture that coaches them through all of this before they go out in all the world. So the report that the women brought about the resurrection 
what to them was utter and complete nonsense. And when they got there, they still didn't understand. So the story, the resurrection story was just chatter, just rubbish, just idle talk. It shouldn't have been considered nonsense. What do you say? Mm -hmm. They should have been aware of that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, praise God for them. We're appreciative of their example of how hard it is to grow spiritually <laughs> in the things of the Lord. Okay, so now, how do you think Jesus felt about this situation? So finally, he shows up at the end of the day, okay? He appears to the eleven. Now, this should be a joyful reunion. People should be happy. Uh, he taught them about the resurrection. The women have been there. The guys from Emmaus have come back. Uh, they should be excited. Jesus should be excited, right? He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after his reason. So not only did they not believe everything that he said earlier, but they didn't believe those people who had seen him and told them. This is how difficult this next 40 days session is gonna be for Jesus. So this is, now this is the first time, according to scripture, that Jesus reveals himself to this hand-picked chosen male leadership. They're trying to eat together, Jesus enters a room, which should be a happy occasion. He told the 12 to expect his death. He told a lot of people, as we see, uh, just, just a few days, just before, just coming in Jerusalem, just, you know, not even a week ago, right? Yeah, just a week ago, he just told them. And they should be, in the, in the greatest ecstasy, it should be such a, an amazing uh, fulfillment of scripture. They should be so happy uh, that right after such a cruel death, Jesus is alive. And Jesus should be happy, Right. You did it, Jesus. You did what you said. You fulfilled so many prophecies. But Jesus isn't happy. There's no warm greeting here. There's no celebration. There's no wonderful reunion. Breathtaking surprise. Jesus was obligated to rebuke them. Rebuke means to rail at, upbraid. What kind of word is that? Scold, reproach, chastise, reprimand, rebuke. Speak disparagingly, reproach to suffer reproach. So Jesus was, felt it necessary to reproach them. Now, reproach is the last thing you want to suffer from Jesus. What do you say? Suffer is not a good word. No one wants to go to the woodshed, <laughs> especially with Jesus. <laughs> especially when it should be the happiest moment of your entire life. Yeah. Uh, it hurts to be corrected, right? Nobody likes it. It's embarrassing, it's shameful. And then you're going to be rebuked by Jesus at this incredible moment. So they should be all happy, but what are they? Their heads drooping. Think of these beards. Oh, my God. <laughs> How long did this go on, right? How, I mean, it just says this, but was this 20 minute? Was it half an hour? Did Jesus rant and rave for an hour? Did he just walk up and down? You know, how, how long did this go on? This is a severe rebuke, okay? Now, Thomas is not at this meeting, as we know. And they, they're not going to be able to look at Jesus in the eye because what? They've been hiding, they've been moping, they've been grieving. They've been uh, hiding away this whole time, fear for three days. They've forgotten everything. They didn't believe that the Messiah had to rise from the dead. So why would they make, make something up like that? It's faithlessness, it's lack of trustworthiness, it's unbelief. It's whom confidence cannot be placed. Okay? Bad news. And then they humiliated the female messengers by their unbelief and disrespect. He says you're hard-hearted, which is a sickness of the heart. Hard-heartedness, destitute of spiritual perception, okay? One who has dry, hard, tough heart. Despite previous resurrection witnesses, they just couldn't get it. So this is, this is hard. This is a hard saying. The men failed a faith test. And there's no, there's no warm, warm group hugs, at least not yet. Now, Thomas was not the only one. Thomas gets a bad rap, right? Uh, who had to see to believe. Now, in the commentaries, you'll be hard pressed to find this fiasco. It's largely minimized. It goes underappreciated. 
it's rare that anyone will even take note of this meeting. What do you say? So Thomas is missing for some reason. We don't know. We can make up some stories if we want. Who knows? But he wasn't there. Okay? Uh, so we can learn some things from Thomas that are important also to help us understand this 40-day 40, 40 period. Because now Jesus is going to come back again. Uh, Jesus' life was at stake, and he's going to go back after Lazarus died. And Thomas says, Let's go with him that we may die. So he showed courageous, courageous leadership. He takes some leadership here and says, hey, guys, Jesus is going back in a difficult situation. We're going to go with him. So last few times Jesus had been in Judea, the Jewish leaders should try to kill him, try to seize him. So there's a good reason why they said, hey, let's not go. So Thomas says, let's do this together. It's a difficult time. He makes this brave speech. Uh, so what we want to see here about Thomas is he's not a weak-willed doubter, self-doubter, rather one who takes a realistic assessment of the danger that they would face and he goes, well, let's go for it. We're, we're going to stick with Jesus. I mean, where else are we going to go, right? And then we find Thomas taking another bold leadership step in John chapter 14 when Jesus gives this saying about his father's house, many dwellings in it. I, I'm going, right? I'm, I'm going to play, prepare a place for you. Now, Thomas steps up, okay, and says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> At least he has the courage to ask the hard question, right? <laughs> so usually it's Peter who does this, but Peter doesn't seem to do it in this occasion. He's gotten tired of doing it. So somebody's got to step up and ask the stupid question, Right? I always felt like I, that was my duty in Bible college is ask the stupid questions, right? I took a lot of grief for that, but you learned a lot. Everybody else wanted to ask. Huh? Everyone else wanted to ask. Yeah, everybody wants to ask, but everybody's afraid to ask it. So I always felt it was my duty in the class to, you know, ask those kind of questions. So Thomas honestly voices the concern for the group. They can't say, yeah, we know where you're going. And they're afraid to say, I don't know where you're going. <laughs> so he wasn't afraid to ask the tough question. Okay, he, wasn't, he, he could sacrifice his pride to ask dumb questions, all right? He would be the dummy for the group. And then Jesus makes this incredible revelation. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes a father except through me. Now, if Thomas didn't ask that question, we wouldn't have this revelation, right? So thank God for Thomas and his boldness and his leadership. And this is one of Jesus' great I am statements, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is one of the most well-known scriptures in the New Testament. And it stems from a question that Thomas was willing to ask. So Thomas is not the famous doubter. And he usually goes unrecognized for his courageous and inquisitive leadership. But we just know him as Doubting Thomas. Thomas is best known for his inability to believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. Thank you, John, for pointing that out, right? <laughs> but what we want to know is that everyone doubted. No one had this expectation. A part of the 40-day seminars to fill in the gaps and to bring them to their Hebrew scriptures so that they're perfectly equipped to not only write the Gospel of Matthew, but also to propagate it into the world. So... Thomas wasn't there on that first occasion. So when he showed up, the disciples told him that Jesus came. And they told him, the disciples told him that we've seen the Lord, uh, John 20, 24. And he says, no, I'm not going to believe it. <laughs> Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, I will not believe it. Okay? Okay. I'm a scientist. I have to touch it. I have to see it. It's a double negative. It means I positively will not believe. It's kind of weird when they saw all the other miracles before. And not only that, but all the teaching and the women and all those who have seen him after he's been raised from the dead. <laughs> it's such a difficult and impossible thing to believe. To believe yeah. So... That's why he's got forever the nickname Doubting Thomas. Probably should capitalize that and make it, you know, kind of professional. 
what we want to see is they all doubting Thomas's. Which which one of them believed in the resurrection? No, no. Not a single Jew. No one. They all needed to physically see the resurrected Jesus in order to believe. They're eyewitnesses of that fact. It was only on the physical evidence that they could be persuaded that he wasn't a phantom, a ghost, a spiritual vision, or an hallucination. The resurrected body was clearly physical. That's why we teach a physical resurrection. Thomas is the original scientist, right? And so then a week later, Jesus comes and house again, John 20, 26. Thomas is there with him this time. And he comes and stands, said, hey, come on, Thomas. Peace be with you. Everybody chill. Take it easy. Don't worry. Reach your hand out. Touch me. Put your finger here. See my hands. Right? What I like about it is Jesus accommodated his lack of faith, right? Which is comforting because, you know, we're not, we don't always have the greatest faith all the time. And he goes, okay, that's what you want to do. Come, come and touch it. Come and see me. He wanted to strengthen their faith and include him in the blessings that lay in store for followers. So this, this is a part of the 40-day teaching session. It's already beginning. Just come touch me, come eat with me, come be with me. This is just in one week, all right? He's already breaking down all these barriers and explaining to them the importance of his resurrection. Okay, we see the beginning of this. And also what we like about Thomas is an honest mind inquiring after truth. Yeah. Okay, he's not, he's not just going to believe yeah. anyone or anything without a valid reason. Faith does not mean we're without reason. There is no competition between faith and reason. Our faith in Christ is reasonable. And he was more than willing to believe once he was satisfied with fact. So it's not even faith when you have fact. It's a fact. Mm -hmm. So it's not a belief. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's a fact. Mm -hmm. So you say believe when he saw the facts, but you don't need faith once you have fact. Faith is something's thing hoped for. The thing hoped for is now in front of you, right? So he had questions he wanted them answered, and I say question everything, okay? Question everything. Why not? Truth fears no question. Mm -hmm. Truth can withstand the hardest inquiry. Truth can withstand the strictest investigation and the most ex demanding examination. Sometimes we don't ask enough questions. The reality is there's always an answer for this person that will seek for that. That's the way truth is. So his doubt had a purpose. Okay, his doubt had a purpose. It didn't drive him away from Jesus. It brought him closer to Jesus, right? Thomas wanted to know the truth. His truth gives evidence of desire to have faith founded in fact. Doubts and questions should lead us closer to investigate the word of God. We can have complete confidence in the word of God. That no matter what kind of questions are raised, if we dig deep enough, we can find an answer that confirms the truth of scripture. And then... Thomas makes this profound declaration. Okay, now not only are you uh, the Savior, but you're my Lord and God, right? Wow, you're Lord and God. And in the scripture, the name God is specifically given to the resurrected Christ. Now he's immediately transformed by this evidence before him. And Thomas is going to go from doubter to from skeptic and cynic to believer, apostle, missionary, and martyr. He goes from unbeliever to believer in an instant, yeah. in an instant. And that's what happens to many of us who doubted or skeptics and critics of Christ, blasphemed him, his name, and even hated him. 
once you come into a legit experience through the Holy Spirit of the resurrected Christ, you are instantly transformed from an unbeliever to a believer and from a, a hater to a lover of Jesus Christ. Come on. Now, in this instant, again, what we're missing is everything that we traditionally think of as a church. Church, hierarchies, bees, liturgies. It's just Jesus and Thomas, and he's immediately changed by this personal encounter. Okay, this is the significance of this, is it's not just the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. It's the fact that that resurrection from the dead will change your life if you're willing to touch the wounds of Christ. Whew. And this declaration is proof of his faith and an affirmation of the deity of Christ. So he comes more than just Christ. He now becomes Lord and God. Okay, he's two things, my Lord and my God. We have to know that whenever they use the word Lord for Jesus, it means God. This is the Lord is the Old Testament word for God. They'd be using Adonai. Uh, Yahweh is the Old Testament word that comes to us. This is Aramaic. They'd be speaking the Aramaic word that's traditional in their culture for Lord God. Okay? This is a learning experience. They learn this post-resurrection. Hand-picked apostles in the presence of Jesus. All right? Jesus doesn't say, no, Tom, you got it wrong. I'm not Lord God. Jesus does not rebuke him for taking the Lord his God in vain. Jesus commends Thomas. Because you have believed and seen, blessed are you, right? You have seen me, you have believed. You're an eyewitness. You've touched me. We're going to spend 40 days together. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And what did Thomas believe? That Jesus was Lord and God. Now, what price did he pay for this? A lot. Now, before this, he doubted the resurrection. He doubted the, de the, de the full deed of Christ. Who knows what else was going on in his mind. But after this, uh, his faith was commended. Jesus commended his faith. All right? And then, of course, this is what every Christian believes about Jesus. Right? Yeah. All right, so the resurrection was not something Thomas or any disciple or Jew of the day had any grounds to believe or imagine possible. And this is a high point of John's gospel, my Lord and my God. It's one of the last testimonies of the apostle John records in his gospel uh, in the, uh, concerning the, the deity of Christ. Let's skip all this. So Jesus tells Thomas to stop doubting and believe, and he did that. After he was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the apostles divided the world up into 12 parts for missionary purpose. Uh, Thomas was assigned to travel to India and spread the Christian faith there. Uh, he ended up in India, 52 AD, according to history. There are seven churches that he planted in India, and to this very day, in India, the Christians call themselves the St. Thomas Christians and trace their heritage all the way back to the Apostle Thomas. All right. So we go back. We'll end here, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus stood among them. He said, peace be with you. They were terrified, thinking it was a ghost. They were troubled. Why do you doubt? Look, touch me. It's me. Touch me. See me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as I have. They still did not believe. He said, took it, ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds to understand scripture. 
And this is the basis for the 40 day period of instruction. And this re-education seminar and the scriptures and the truth find its way into Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, very close to that. In other, uh, Luke's gospel has many shared parts with Matthew called the Q document, 235 verses. And of course, Matt, uh, Luke has his own uh, portions, but this is exactly the same gospel preached from the very beginning, that the Messiah, the anointed one will suffer, rise from the dead. Repentance will be preached to all nations. The vehicle is preaching is to go into all the nations, which includes Gentiles, beginning here in Jerusalem, and you are eyewitnesses of these things. When we did, when we read the Gospels, we are witten, we are reading eyewitness accounts. The end result of that, in my opinion, is the Gospel of Matthew. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hope this has been meaningful to you and helpful.